Hi, I'm David from Levika Photography, and today we're going to be introducing you to a macro series of videos. A series of macro videos. Does that make sense? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, let's start off with when it comes to a macro lens, how do you pick a macro lens? So these are my macro lenses that I currently own. There's a couple that aren't in here, but this is the, the gist of it. In this case, my favorite macro lens on the planet, this is a Nikon Micro. And this one's an f3.5. I also have a 2.8. And these lenses were designed for doing copy work. So basically, they needed to have a perfect flat field. So if you're shooting um, uh, ads for magazines that were all laid out back in the 80s, uh, you would shoot it with this lens and then you would take that film and send it off uh, to the magazine publisher. And that kept everything perfectly flat. <clears throat> so basically there's different variations of focal lengths to be able to do that. The beauty of macro is that all of these lenses are considered flat field meaning that there is no barrel distortion. So if you look at your image you don't get a spherization or a pin, pin cushion effect uh, going the other way when you're zooming in and out. It's just flat or very close to flat. And the other thing too is at their highest apertures they usually don't vignette very much. So in my opinion I think that macro lenses are usually just better quality lenses in general. And with macro lenses I highly recommend that you guys look at macro lenses that are manual focus. And the reason why is you want manual aperture, manual focus, you want to be able to control things. And a good example why is let's say if you're shooting this on the camera this way and you get one to one, what if we want to get uh, four to one? How can we do that? Well, you get a reverse mount where the lens mounts backwards onto the camera. And then now you've got a four times magnification. But with this one, you have to actually zoom out to infinity to be able to do that because if you were zoomed all the way in, you'd be hitting the actual lens element. That's way too close. This is the Sony E-mount uh, 30mm f3.5 macro. Typically macro lenses have a higher f-stop than a normal uh, lens in that range. And they, they have to, uh, just to keep the image quality high. But there's a lot of macro lenses that start at f2.8. I have a couple. And this one starts at f3.5. This is my only autofocus macro lens. The only reason why is because I use it for video. And it, you want to be able to uh, shoot macro with autofocus just in video. And that's the only time I ever actually use this. I don't really use it for anything else. Although this one does do a close focusing about three quarters of an inch away. The biggest problem though is when you get that close to an object, you can't light it correctly because you can't get the light around the front of the lens. So that becomes an issue. But what do you need to know about buying a macro lens? Uh, the best macro lenses uh, have a magnification of one to one. Meaning whatever the object is on one side uh, of the lens, as it goes into the lens, actually it's easier for me to do it like this, if your object is here and it goes into the lens, the convergence of the lens is here and then it goes to the sensor the same distance on both sides. That's one to one. So if it's one to two, it's twice the distance. One to three, it's three times the distance. One to four, it's out here. Are there lenses that go the other way? That multiply it even more? There are. There's actually a couple out there that go one to ten, or sorry, ten to one. So that means that whatever's on this side is magnified 10 times on this side. So when you go to pick a lens, I always recommend that people find one that's at least 1 to 2. This is a perfect example. So <clears throat> this one is 1 to 1 with the uh, extension tube adapter or 1 to 2 without it. This is a Minolta 100mm uh, f4 macro and this is a great macro lens. I love this thing. Sorry this is f3.5. Uh, extremely sharp. 
Now, when it comes to macro lenses, there's different types. There's a lot of lenses that you'll find that are identical to each other, like the Nikon AI, but they either start at f3.5 or f2.8. There is a reason for that. So the ones that start at f2.8 actually fall off at f16 and are barely usable at f22, and in this case, this one's usable uh, from f3.5 all the way to f22 and still fairly sharp at f32. So when you look at f-stops, it's more critical in macro photography to have a lens that has a deeper depth of field consistently that is sharp. So, you know, higher f-stop macro lenses are actually a good thing. So anyway, <clears throat> if you were to look for a lens and this is one thing that, this, this would be what I would call kind of the current criteria of a macro lens. Somewhere between 80 and 100 millimeters, 105 millimeters in focal length that does a magnification of one to one. That's a perfect place to start for lens. You can go autofocus, but I recommend that you guys find a lens that you can use manually. Uh, I know Tamron makes one that's really good, that's primarily out of focus. Sigma makes one. Sony just came out with a 90mm f2.8 macro that I have not been able to try yet. But those are going to be, in general, very rock solid lenses. Okay, so let's skip ahead here. Let's talk about macro zooms. So I've got two of these. These are Vivitar Series 1s, and these are 70 to 210s. Uh, this one is a, this is kind of a strange macro lens. This is very unusual for a zoom. <clears throat> so this one's a 1 to 2.5 magnification. And what happens with this is when you zoom it all the way out, in order to get it into macro mode, you have to slide this all the way around to this side, and it'll only go into macro mode at 210 millimeter, and it's locked. And this gives you a magnification of 1 to 2.5, meaning your image is going to be 2.5 times smaller than life size on a full frame camera. A little bit more on a uh, APS-C size. Now this one is probably the best deal in macro photography around. This is an AI lens, a Nikon mount, and this is a uh, 70 to 210 f3.5 but it's a constant aperture, and this one, it doesn't matter if you're at 70 or all the way at 210, it goes into macro. And this one does have a switch where you have to make sure that it's locked into macro. The button's right here on the side, and it allows you to rotate it back and forth. This will do everything that you ever wanted to do, and you can find these used for about 70 bucks. And these are absolutely phenomenal, and they come in every mount that you can possibly think of. So anyway, except for the Sony E-mount, you have to use an adapter. But, you know, that's either here or there. This one's a, a Nikon mount lens, and this has got a very strong magnification, it's very sharp, but, you know, how you utilize this is completely different from how you think it would be utilized. When it comes to zoom lenses, you would think that at 210 millimeter, all the way to telephoto, that's as close as you're going to get to the object, it's actually the opposite. It's all the way at 70 millimeter. That's where you get closest to the object. Same with the Tokina. So with this one, at 28 millimeter, you get closest to the object. So that kind of causes a problem. How do you deal with this? So now we're going to go into how to use macro lenses. And this is the part that gets kind of confusing. So really quick, <clears throat> when it comes to bodies, you have a couple of different options. I, right here I have the Sony a7R, which is a full frame body. I have the uh, Sony a6000, which is APS-C size. Personally, I prefer APS-C size for doing macro work. Because it's a smaller sensor, it's going to have a deeper depth of field naturally. And when I'm doing macro work, I want to get as much focus in, as as I can as possible. So if you're shooting bugs, you definitely want to use an APS-C size camera just to get the whole bug in focus. Uh, but, you know, realistically, the best camera on the planet to do this with would probably be a mirrorless four-thirds, like a uh, 
Olympus OMD EM1 that is a uh, two times crop sensor because that gives you double the depth of field of a full, front, full frame 35 millimeter. That's a lot to say. Okay, so from here, the only other thing I wanted to add is if you find macro lenses like this one that are one to four, that are, or actually this one's one to 3.2, that are kind of tricky to use, the crazy thing is you can buy adapter rings that allow you to mount them backwards onto a camera body. And what that does is that allows you to increase the magnification to actually one to one. So that's one way of doing macro photography on a budget. But we're going to get into extension tubes next. Okay, so this is the extreme side of macro photography. Now we've got a Vivitar Series 1 210. And this is the 210 f2.8 f to f4. And this one goes into macro mode when it's zoomed all the way out at 210. So right now it's a 210 and we have it at f16. And then we're shooting this little tiny screw right here. So I'll put the quarter next to that screw just so you have an idea of what we're taking a picture of. Now, uh, this section right here is brings this lens from 1 to 2.5 to closer to 1 to 1. And then this section here makes this lens 2 to 1. And then this section here makes this lens closer to 3 to 1. And then I've got a tilt shift adapter on here, or not shift, just tilt adapter on here, that's tilted out about mm, one degree. And what that does is that increases our depth of field just a little bit. But the extension from here to here, you know, now we're at six to one instead of one to one. So that means that our screw over here is 600 times larger than it actually is in real life. And there's the photo of it. So this is kind of the extreme version of what you can do with this. But the most important thing is to achieve a proper depth of field. Macro photography is actually better when you can get the lens farther away from your subject. The closer you get to the subject, the shallower depth of field that you end up with. It doesn't matter if you're stopped down to f22 or f32. If the lens is only an inch away, that means that you're going to have an extremely shallow depth of field no matter what. So the farther the lens is away from your object, the more of a depth of field range you have. And we can stop this down, theoretically, uh, down to, let's see what we got here. If we're wide open, F, yeah, right now I believe this is at, I have to look upside down, F8. And at F8, this looks like it's completely in focus with no change of depth of field. Here's the actual photo. Okay, so this is the extreme side of it. And now, <clears throat> just to prove a point, let's try this with a regular lens. So now we took our little tiny screw and with our seven inches of extensions, we put on a Vivitar, uh, this is a current series one 85 millimeter f1.8 lens. Just a standard portrait lens. A not very exciting lens, but in this case, uh, we want to see what this is actually going to do. So, it, you can see back here on the back of the camera, I'll zoom in, and we've got it focused in, but our biggest problem is, even though we have it stepped down, uh, we can't get it fully in focus, the entire object because of our depth of field, because we're too close to the object. So this is the problem that I'm talking about. Even though that object is this small, at what is currently f22, the depth of field is still about as thin as paper. And it's not able to cover the entire image. I mean, just look at the image right here. Now the other one, of course, the screw is a little smaller but because we're closer or farther away, it works a lot better. So let's try this one more time with a different lens. This is a uh, Spartan uh, focus magnifying rail. And what this allows me to do is shift the camera horizontally to where I want to get the object 
perfectly in the center and then actually use this to focus instead of the lens. So what I want to do is, you can tell right here, if I zoom in, magnify this once, um, I'm focused in right on the edge of the screw. But now I can just tweak it to where just the inside is in focus. Hmm. That's kind of shaky, but right here is what I'm looking for. So now when I hit this, you can see that the edges of the screw are still out of focus, but we're at f3.5. The second we step down to f22, now everything's in focus. Okay, so from right here, we are looking at 13 second exposure. And again, here's our screw. This is the Minolta 100 millimeter f4. And now we are running, uh, let me see here. This is going to be extremely obnoxious here. We are running a total of 8.5 inches of macro adapterness. That's just insane. Okay, so let me take a photo. All right, stay right there, Allison. Don't move because this part of the video I'm going to chop out. It's just a 13 second exposure. Okay, so here's what we have. Now, here's the photo. And what you can basically tell is that uh, it looks like, and if we zoom in here and just take a quick look at our photo, uh, we're still have just a very shallow depth of field. So the head of the screw is in focus, but the outer edge is soft over here, and then this area is still soft over here. So realistically, what I would do at this point is try to focus farther away. So we just pull our camera back a little bit. And we find our, our screw again there, which we did, thankfully because this thing is not easy to see. And then we simply back the focus off on the camera to allow me to back up a little bit. And at this point, I'm going to have to remove probably an inch of extension tubes. That way we can get the entire object in focus. Okay, so, okay, so I just took out one inch of our extension tubes. So we dropped this thing down now to about seven inches. And I just took an exposure. And if we look at, whoop, if we look at our actual image now, let me zoom out here, there's more in focus. So the whole key is to figure out what's the best combination of getting your object as big as you possibly can, but getting the lens as far, as far away from the object as possible while keeping your magnification in order to get the proper depth of field to shoot the object. Now there's another way to do it, and I am not fond of this way, but it's called follow focusing. So really quick, uh, I'll show you how this is done. All right, so this is a technique called follow focusing. And right now we've got our lens stopped down, so if you want to come over here. And we can do this with the macro rail, and this is the easiest way to do it. So what we do is, you can see our peak focusing red is popping there. Now we back it all the way out. Now you can see in the very foreground, we have our red. Right here is where we would take a picture. And then we scoot into the middle, right here, and catch the rest of it and take a picture and then we go to the end of it to where the end is just in focus right there and we take another picture and you bracket all those together and then you, you erase the blurry er edges in Photoshop and build the file up that way. That's called follow focusing in macro. I don't like doing that because it's, it's not, to me it's not complete and when you're in a production mode, if you're actually doing work for a company doing product photography at this scale 
you need to be able to switch out stuff quick. So you can't actually do that in a real life working situation. You can do that out on your own, you know, no problem. If you glue a cricket to a stick and want to take a picture of him to where he's completely in focus, by all means, go for it. But in the real world, when you're actually trying to make money with photography, that's just doing nothing but slowing you down. So the key to this whole thing is to get the lens as far away from the object as possible while maintaining your magnification. That way you get the entire thing in focus. So anyway, I hope you guys like this video on, on macro. I hope it didn't uh, wear you guys out completely. Uh, if you like this video, leave me a comment, give me a thumbs up. Uh, click on the ads because it helps me down the road. And otherwise, you guys have a good day. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more information like this. We'll see you.